so uh, my name is Chris Thomas, um, and my talk is about how uh, we're integrating uh, Bootstrap Framework uh, with Plone. Um, this this really isn't just about Bootstrap, though. It's really about any of the more popular CSS frameworks that we have available. Um, and some of the unique challenges that we faced uh, whenever uh, we were looking at frameworks and why we chose what we did. Um, so again, um, my name is Chris Thomas. I work for Penn State University at the Smeal College of Business. And um, our college, we have uh, 15 websites approximately and counting. Um, uh, we have a team of three web developers, most of which are hiding in the crowd. Um, and uh, we have two designers that uh, do most of our uh, Photoshop work for, uh, for any of our websites, print design and so forth. Um, we also have uh, a couple of multimedia guys um, that do a lot of photography for our college, uh, video designers um, that uh, shoot video um, for uh, publications and uh, external sources. Um, we also have a PHP programming team um, that does a lot of internal apps. Uh, we have an e-learning team um, that is currently um, building uh, some e-learning stuff in Drupal, and we have approximately 150 content contributors in the college that maintain uh, the SMEAL web presence. Uh, so whenever we were looking at frameworks, you know, we had challenges. Um, you know, there was, we, what I what we walked into is basically there was a lot of uh, in, you know ZMI customizations that were uh, you know inside the ZMI they were not um, you know they were not version controlled uh, so kind of interesting there we had to try to work uh, around getting that those customizations out of the ZMI um, um, so that we can uh, keep track of them and maintain them a little better. Uh, we had some outside constituents that uh, demanded more f design flexibility and. Um, you know, how many here have uh, dealt with uh, building the old theme products and, you know, you were kind of stuck with, once it was installed, you kind of were expecting to forget about it and, you know, uh, so th being able to be flexible and being able to install, uh, or, you know, whatever comes down to pike from marketing, for example, for us, you know, we didn't need to be able to quickly put that into action and get it up on the sites. Um, with that in mind, you know, I mean, historically, I always felt that it really wasn't geared toward rapid, frequent design changes, and um, not wholesale site design changes, but just sectional site design changes, where marketing comes up with some great idea to trick a bunch of kids into coming to school with us. We need a section of the site that looks completely different than everything else for a marketing campaign. Um, so. We, Plone just really wasn't geared for that other than, you know, doing some hacking in the ZMI and the custom folder to do so. Uh, same thing with, like, we have a lot of media um, that was being implemented on our sites and uh, from video, image galleries, uh, some custom JavaScripting um, and jQuery things going on. Multiple people editing um, the design, so, uh, you know, myself, uh, Beth and Kyle and so forth is in the crowd. Um, they, you know, we're constantly stepping on each other's to toes and you couldn't be in the ZMI at the same time uh, working on the same files and things. So just looking for some, some flexibility there. Um, you know, a greater standardization of code and processes. So we could basically write modules um, with the CSS framework for a particular instance and then we can repeat that. We can source, you know, we can uh, put that in version control and then it's consistent across the board. Um, so, you know, the big thing was, is, you know, for goals, we wanted to allow designers to be designers and, you know, let them do what they do best, and that's, you know, draw up websites. And, you know, in the past, they, everyone complained that, you know, Plum was just too restrictive design-wise. So, uh, you know, that was in the, same, in the same way, allow people that don't know anything about Plone. They don't need to, just, you know, stay away from Plone, just you do what you do best and give them the ability if, you know, because we have people that are really good with HTML, JavaScript, CSS, and things like that. But getting, you know, teaching them how to uh, do anything inside of Plone was kind of a, a roadblock at times. Um, you know, the other thing is uh, get people, get Plone out of theming. Um, I, I personally feel that it's not Plone's responsibility to be uh, embedded in your, you know, into your themes um, and in design work. 
So, you know, try to get as much of the Plone stuff out of the themes. And um, so, and then along those lines, take advantage of what the CSS frameworks give you. Um, there's a lot of them out there, and some of them are better than others. Uh, but uh, they do a lot of the heavy lifting for us, and there's a lot of smart people that have built these themes that, you know, they've thought about these things, and they, they've come up with these frameworks, so we didn't have to. So use what they give you. Um, and obviously Diazo, uh, or Diazo, I'm not sure which is the proper, but uh, use, uh, use Diazo to, um, you know, to implement all this and put it all together. Um, so with CSS frameworks, I mean, just literally there's, there's a lot of them out there. I mean, the popular ones, uh, Bootstrap, uh, Skeleton, frame, uh, Foundation, and so forth. Um, they're all mature frameworks, and they have a lot of uh, uh, really cool features that are built in. So you know, take advantage of them. Um, whenever we were looking at them, we just kind of we we decided on Bootstrap just simply because it gave us the functionality that we were looking for. It was close to it out of the box. We didn't have to hack it. We didn't have to modify it. And obviously, the less modifications and hacking and customizing that we have to do, it makes our jobs easier and faster. Um, so, you know, the flexibility thing, um, you know, when we were looking at that, I mean, we needed to be able to have uh, the ability to have mul multiple responsive behaviors. Um, some of them do more of a fluid, uh, you know, from a desktop right down to a phone. Some of them take a more stepped approach where, you know, they, they snap to different sizes. Um, so we wanted to have the flexibility to do either, depending on the content. Um, you know, built in or close to it media support um, for video, slideshows, light boxes, and so forth. The, there's a lot of, you know, custom things that are being written um, or have been done with the frameworks from other people. So, you know, it's nice because Bootstrap has an enormous community and there's a lot of things going on around Bootstrap and um, it's not difficult to find answers to questions if you have them um, with Bootstrap. So. We kind of went that route uh, because of all those factors. Um, so uh, the one thing that we had a challenge with, and you know, and what I mentioned earlier was, you know, the, the simple fact that we have a lot of content that um, is very, very customized, and you can't. It was it was more difficult to build it with, you know, a, a Zote page template, for example. Um, again, because you end up in a ZMI nine chance out ten to, to quickly throw this thing together and get it up online because a lot of times our marketing department would call and say, hey, you know, can we have this done yesterday? And you know, it just it's not we didn't have realistic time frames. So we were looking at ways to um, get that content up fast and not put all the workload on our web team and also uh, distribute that to our designers and so forth. So the uh, the solution that we were lucky that we come up with to do this, um, basically uh, we also have a uh, we have a file server that all of our um, our designers they they write um, you know that's where they save all their, their images and so forth. Um, so we're housing some Bootstrap HTML and uh, any JavaScripting that might come with that if there's any custom animations or whatever they want to do for this particular instance. Um, we're putting that on an external server. And then with the Azo, just pulling that entire block in um, to our site. And um, uh, the one example that I'll show you um, is our current uh, project that we're um, getting set to launch. Um, basically, the front page is nothing but static content that's being pulled from an external server. Because of what was asked of us, asked of us from the design standpoint, um, it, it, it would be difficult to pull this off just with Plone's tools out of the box. Um, the cool thing about it uh, that we discovered later on um, was the simple fact that if uh, if you build build that external HTML correctly um, and and do things right, we can allow our constituents like marketing. We can call them up and say, "Hey, go to this web address and look at this panel, essentially, of uh, HTML. Is this what you had in mind? Is, is this good? And if it is, uh, renaming of a couple of files and it's live. And um, so we can preview it." off-site first and before we actually launch the thing. Um, so, and this, this falls back to, you know, there's this, 
like our homepage, basically, there's not a whole lot of plumbing going on on it at this point. Um, basically, the navigation, well, now actually, navigation is not even plumbing right now. Um, the footer and the search basically is all that's plown on our homepage at this point, just because of the customizations that we had to do. Um, if I uh, jump out of here quick. So this is kind of the project we've been working on. It's still a work in progress, but um, it's getting closer. And let's see if I get that snap too. Um, so basically, you know, th this area of the site um, is being pulled from a external um, source. And, uh, you know, the HTML, CSS, um, any imagery, all that stuff is all sitting on an external server. Um, it just allows us to be very flexible. And, you know, this is, you know, the text is HTML and we can, you know, the buttons and everything. It's all bootstrap classes and so forth to do so. We tried to stick to that as closely as possible. So, um, and then the other section is down below. Um, this is the idea that they come up with for like these panels, their marketing panels. Again, this is all driven to, you know, get kids to come to school and, you know, pay us money. So, uh, you know, these things are, these panels are also built and are housed on the external part of the site or the external server and then pulled in. Um, so it gives us a great deal of flexibility because Plone is completely out of the way for these really custom situations. And so, and, and this is basically the concept that is, um, I was get, I got creative one night and drew a little picture. Um, but basically the concept is um, out on the external server uh, is the HTML, and that is all it is there. There's no, um, there's, there's no uh, HTML tags there. It's just the block of HTML that you need to pull. And it's important just from the standpoint of it puts less of a load on, load, uh, on your like page load times. Pulling that stuff across, because you want to pull over just what you need, because you are making a request to an external server. So you gotta be a little careful there. Um, the only thing that we uh, had to change, we discovered here was the, uh, you have to, if, if you wanna be able to preview this stuff on the external server, you gotta have that bootstrap CSS, all the CSS and JavaScript over there so that it can be previewed. Um, so there's other ways we can do it, but what we basically did was right at the very top of that HTML document, we're just referencing what we need there we can preview it there, but then we're not pulling that CSS or JavaScript, unless we need it, over to the Plone site. So we don't duplicate loads of CSS and so forth. Um, again, it goes back to, it was really cool, was just the fact that we can show all this stuff to the marketing team and then let them banter over whether it's what they wanted or not, so. Um, the other thing that, um, you know, we have a lot of media content, we have video and, um, uh, and so forth, and we're constantly being asked to, to put this stuff on our site. We use a, a, a server, or a server uh, technology called MediaCore. Um, it's actually a Python-based uh, video, um, video hosting uh, server. And um, what we're working on now is basically uh, you can uh, go, the embedding onto a page works off of tagging, um, is the way MediaCore works. And it, it, uh, so we're creating the tags so that we can just simply embed this stuff into, uh, into our Plone pages um, with a tag. Uh, another thing that everybody likes, I wish they would go away, but um, is slideshows um, for like the big carousel things on the front page that is constantly moving and making everyone nauseous and so forth. But everybody loves them, your decision makers, all the people, you know, your deans and everything just think they're totally great because you're making something move on a page. So um, you have to quell them somehow. Uh, the one other thing that we, you know, Bootstrap has a, uh, a carousel uh, tool. And so I wanted to try to figure out a way to take advantage of that particular uh, tool um, with not using any sort of a clone product, like an installed thing. Um, so uh, we, uh, we put together a, a, a through the web dexterity content type. 
um, that basically is a slide tool um, or a slide product. And basically, you just go in and add a, a title description, um, what you want the little button to say if there's a button on the page. Um, and if that button links out to something, um, well, I guess if there's a button, it would link, Chris. But um, it, so that they, you, know, you can link to another page. So, and there was just a, a, a quick temp, uh, Zote page template that we threw in a custom folder that would put all the bootstrap classes in there. And then we used the Ozo then to just throw that into the carousel on the home page of the site. So it, it was kind of a, a, an exercise in just proving uh, a point that y there's enough uh, tools available to us with, uh, especially with Plum 4, 2, and above with Dexterity, uh, the Ozo, um, Bootstrap, that you don't need a product to do so. You can do this without a product. Um, and yeah, I guess I was a little ahead of myself. And uh, so, you know, th this is what we're talking about, and I have an example of that. Provided I can get out to the internet here. So this was, uh, uh, this was actually, holy cow, what is going on there? <laughs> this is the, the, they like this, the, the moving part. <laughs> yes. I don't know what's going on with this adapter, but anyway. There's a lot moving here. But um, this slideshow uh, is, is Bootstrap's carousel. And... Um, I apologize for this thing hopping around. That's kind of what's going on here. But and basically, uh, we created a folder um, on the right at the root of the site for our carousels and. Um, not sure. There we go. So these little guys here are basically their carousel tool. Um, it was created with this dexterity content type. And it's just basically, I'll just quickly show you the form. Um, and that's it. Um, it's, it's really a really simple product. But, I mean, you didn't, there wasn't a whole lot of uh, you know, rocketry going on here to, uh, to get this. They just, we, needed, we needed the fields in there to get the content in. Um, and then this, this all, once it's saved, gets wrapped in the, the bootstrap classes, and then we just use the area to shoot it to the carousel on the front, on the front end um, of the site. So, you know, the uh, one other thing I mentioned and, you know, is just getting blown out of its own way um, for, uh, for theming. And, you know, uh, this included things like column logic. Um, you know, our first uh, couple of stints with any sort of uh, thing with Dexter or with uh, Diazo was basically to take the entire content well, both left and right columns and a center column, and just dump it on the page. Plone did its thing with the columns. Um, but, uh, you, you know, we wanted to try, because of the responsive you know, nature of your frameworks, we wanted to try to get Plone out of there for that stuff, just because you run into some issues. So we began working on, um, you know, getting rid of that stuff. Now, uh, this is a little snippet of our solution for, uh, for Bootstrap on how to make those columns, you know, appear and disappear. I've seen a bunch of different ways, and I actually just discovered a new way that seems to work, a uh, it looks a little cleaner than this mess, uh, but um, basically it just walks through and tests to see if there are any children in the column, and if it's not there, drop the column and then uh, adjust the, uh, the class, the bootstrap class, to span the, the, the content well to however many columns it needs. So, I mean, we typically are using, I think, uh, 282 um, for our 12-column our grid. 
Um, so you know, then we expand the, the center column to 10 columns. Um, so this was my little um, spiel about the ZMI. Um, I'm a sysadmin at heart, so like I'm paranoid and I don't like people messing with my stuff. So um, we've all had issues. <laughs> we probably all have had nightmares about um, you know, people getting in there and meddling with things inside of ZMI. Um, so that was a big goal of ours, was you know, just get out of my ZMI. <laughs> um, so uh, you know, we're working on a, we had a lot of uh, customizations in the ZMI, um, especially like portal view customizations that just, uh, and again, you can't track any of that stuff because it's, it's in the database. So, and that also goes back to, we all you know, know about um, those customizations breaking upgrades and then having to track down and figure out what's breaking in your, uh, in your upgrade steps. Uh, Re-engineering them um, into uh, you know, content types and products is very time consuming and it's something that uh, we typically uh, at SMEAL don't have a whole lot of time. Uh, well, the time is not a luxury we have. So. Um, writing a lot of different products to, to address some of these things. Um, and most of what I've noticed with our college is, you know, a lot of our things are visual. They're, we're, like our marketing team drives everything. So um, it's got to look pretty. And uh, so that, just getting everything out of the ZMI is big for us. Um, so, you know, our first uh, things we, you know, typically do is uh, go in and remove all CSS and JavaScript from the custom folder and get that into the theme. Um, anything, uh, so basically the only things that we end up with in a custom folder, because we don't know where else to put them, is uh, the Python logic and any, uh, and so forth. Um, it just makes everything a lot easier to manage at the end of the day. Um, so, you know, there were some caveats, uh, some things to just watch out for whenever you're, um, you know, what we discovered. Um, Columns.css, there is a class in there called row, and Bootstrap also uses that, so it blows everything up. Um, it doesn't look right. So what we've been doing is just disabling that CSS document. Um, We'll have to try that. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I'll have to look and see um, if, what it breaks there. Um, but I know, like, just from not dealing with tiny MCE, just in general, it, it breaks bootstrap. So um, that was one thing um, that we were looking at. Um, you'd be careful with those uh, those external calls with the Yazo. Um, we try to lump them. Um, like the the big homepage banner that you saw in my example, that was one call just for that piece. But then. The panels down below, we uh, all any we're trying to max like the maximum of five panels are going to show up down there at any given time. Um, there might be less, but no more than five. So we're just grabbing all five of those panels at one time, so we're not going out and grabbing each one of them individually, just to minimize the the, uh, the external calls out. Um, you know, some other little things. Uh, and uh, Chrissy had mentioned it in her training. Um, you know, was uh, with the Ozo and the there are ways that you don't need to use multiple uh, in, you know, HTML templates um, for a design, for the most part. Once in a while, yeah, there's some uh, cases where the designs are totally different, so you have to. But um, you know, what we found was you, know, you can basically manipulate any of the HTML in your, um, in your themes with the Yazo enough to basically one index, you know, index.html uh, file uh, can basically power your whole site. So, um, you know, and basically it comes back to build backwards. Start at your simplest pages first, get those up, and then you can use Diazo's conditions and so forth to add or remove and tweak, or tweak the design as it's needed for different uh, sections of the site. Um, so, you know, going back, uh, you know, some of the things we're still looking at, um, you know, off of Penn State, and I'm sure you, maybe you guys have heard that like we got uh, whacked really hard uh, a couple of years ago with accessibility. Um, so to, to the extent of a class action lawsuit, so um, they're t they're pretty paranoid about it now. <laughs> so 
uh, you know, we're looking at ways to use the Yazo to add some things. There's, uh, there was a couple of little things that Plone um, wasn't doing. Um, I'm not sure if that's improved there with 4.3. Um, I know like the, there were some things like the body, the body tag um, needed to be uh, different for every single page. There was something with the body tag I do remember. Beth might actually be able to answer those questions better than I can because I don't like accessibility. But um, So we're looking for ways. Uh, tables were another one that um, were getting hit really hard um, in, uh, for us. All of our tables were not accessible. And some of it was just the users were just sticking tables in and then putting a table inside of that. And then, hey, it would be nice to have a list inside of that. So. There's a lot of user things that can happen there. Um, but so we're looking for ways to uh, use Bootstrap um, to put classes and uh, or put Bootstrap classes and uh, using Diazo to tweak some of the accessibility things for our purposes. Um, so yeah, that, that's the, the the accessibility thing is huge for us. So um, and that's basically all I have. Any questions? I put everybody to sleep. I was told that I was right before lunch, so I wanted to get through this so we can get out there first. So. <laughs> no? That's a good question. Um, <laughs> yeah. There is, uh, we discovered a. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so a gentleman asked, uh, how do you solve the, uh, the multiple jQuery issue um, when you're using a framework like Bootstrap? Because Bootstrap has requirements that the you know, is kind of behind on the jQuery story. So um, there is a jQuery migrate, I believe it's called, script, that basically will make, backwards com it will backward make your jQuery backwards compatible. Um, I can't remember where I discovered that plugin. It might have been on the jQuery site somewhere, or one of the jQuery-ish sites. But basically, it will take, if you need, Plone needs, you know, version 1.0. <laughs> I think that's where we're at now, right? <laughs> uh, 1.4. So it needs 1.4, but I think, uh, like, Bootstrap is asking for 1.10, maybe. It's, it's significantly different. Um, if you have this in place, the, this jQuery migrate script, it will make them backwards compatible. And it actually seems to work pretty well. Um, I'll have an example. I can show you the HTML, um, or I can show you the, the, the script then. But um, it seems to solve that issue, and you know, it works. It, it, yeah, it's another script you got to call in, but you know, it could be worse, I guess. It could not work at all. So. Anybody else? So I've just successfully lulled everyone to sleep. <laughs> yeah, we're on four two. Um, Doesn't sound like it's on. I was just saying that I think uh, Plone 4.2 is the is slightly older, and 4.3 is more compatible to newer versions of jQuery by just uh, upgrading Plone app jQuery package. So it might be helpful. Yeah, actually, I, I come to think of it, I think uh, Plum 4.3 is on 1.7-ish of jQuery. Come, so. Are you sure you're uh, C. Thomas on Twitter? Yeah. C. Thomas Oh, you know what? You're right. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> I always forget that because I have, like, several different accounts and so forth. Because I went to uh, the Twitter C. Thomas user and was like, hey, he's from Paris and he has hair. <laughs> <laughs> that, was what, that was one of my younger pictures. Sorry, just saying. <laughs>
All right, well, thanks, everyone.